Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips. And uh, a couple of announcements. First of all, it's almost conference time, November 8th through 10th. We have Dr. T. Colin Campbell, author of China Study in Whole, Dr. Alan Goldhammer, author of The Pleasure Trap and the owner of True North Health Center. Um, they do amazing work there. Um, Laura Theodore, the jazzy vegetarian, um, I'm on her TV show every week on PBS. And Susan Levin from the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. I mean, it's an all-star cast and you don't want to miss it. Oh, and my friend, Dr. Janice Stanger, who gives some incredible lectures about employer health plans and um, 10 Dangerous Myths About Protein. This is a lecture you haven't heard before. It's really, really good. So, and Anyway, make sure you get your body signed up for that. It's definitely time to register. November 8th through 10, Columbus, Ohio. Be here. You will enjoy yourself. It'll change your life. And then uh, the next intro to plant-based nutrition, November 4th. Um, it's a 90-minute, power-packed, off to a fast start, science and skills uh, of plant-based eating. So you don't want to miss that. Alrighty. I have two topics today. I want to talk about Alzheimer's disease and I want to talk about hypothyroidism, not because they're related to each other. Well, in a way they are because it's all foodborne illnesses, you know, but, uh, um, but because there are some issues with diagnosis and history and causation and all that sort of thing. So I have been, as you guys know, who've been watching this for a while, all year long I've sprinkled these video clips with um, uh, commentary on Alzheimer's disease being uh, the result of a westernized diet. And we really don't have evidence that you can eat your way out of Alzheimer's disease like you can type 2 diabetes, particularly if it's progressed to a pretty severe level. But there is evidence you can avoid it if you will eat a low-fat plant-based diet. Um, I've written lots of articles on the topic, cited research showing the relationship between diet and Alzheimer's disease, but some recent information I discovered is really interesting that I want to share with you. And it really indicates it's not genes, it's not pesticides and herbicides, it's definitely the food. So. It might uh, interest you to know that until the 20th century, Alzheimer's disease was virtually, it was unknown. In fact, the first case study was published in 1907 by a psychiatrist by the name of Alzheimer. That's how the disease got its name. So how did we go from no cases, first case ever reported in 1907, to the place where 100 years later, a little over 100 years later, we have millions of people with Alzheimer's disease? Well, one theory is we didn't know what it was. And the idea that diagnostic testing is improved and that's why the number of cases of Alzheimer's disease has increased is it's almost hard to imagine that people actually put forth theories like this with a straight face right now. I mean, we're supposed to believe that a significant number of people in um, the early 1900s had completely lost their memory and couldn't be left alone without threat of burning down the house or wandering off into the plains and nobody ever said anything about it. No cases were reported. I, I just don't think that's the, the case. And um, this theory has been put forth to explain the increasing incidence of autism. You know, 50 years, children who uh, had, were not verbal and, you know, walked around in circles flapping their hands, nobody knew that there was anything wrong with that. But now that sophisticated doctors know how to identify that as a problem, that's why we have an epidemic. So I digress a little bit. But coming back to Alzheimer's disease, um, looking at pathology books back in the 1900s, no mention of anything resembling Alzheimer's. A review of articles written by by neurologists and doctors. Doesn't mention it either. Nothing found in autopsy patients uh, representing the manifestations of Alzheimer's like tangles and plaques. So another theory put forth is that, well, maybe people weren't living as long then. Well, lifespans haven't increased as much as many people realize because we really reduced significantly infant mortality, which made it statistically look like people were living longer. They're really not living much longer at this point in time. But U.S. Census data for the year 1900 shows that there were 3.2 million people over the age of 60. And if you look at the incidence rate of Alzheimer's disease today and you apply it to that population, there should have been 36,300 cases of Alzheimer's in the United States at that time, but again, not a single case reported. So I don't think it's that we're living longer, and I don't think it's that we didn't have diagnostic criteria and that's why it wasn't recognized. I think what it really is, is the food. 
And to add to my contention, um, Alzheimer's disease is geographically concentrated in westernized countries that eat a westernized diet. You don't see it being so prevalent in areas like Asia, South America, and Africa. So it's not genes, it's not diagnostic skill, it's, it really is the food. We know that a diet high in animal foods and protein causes coronary artery disease in 40% of the population in the United States. And that blood flow to all parts of the body, including the brain, are affected. So all of this to say that this is a new phenomenon. It wasn't going on in the early, late 1800s, early 1900s. This has all come about as the amount of animal food and fat and protein in the diet has increased and the incidence of cardiovascular disease has increased too. So I've said this many times, I, I don't like being sick, I'm a terrible patient, do everything I can to stay out of doctor's offices and that sort of thing, but I have to say that if something were gonna be wrong with me, I think the worst thing would be to have it be that I couldn't think and interact with people and be engaged in life anymore. I'd rather keep my mind than anything else. So um, if you wanna uh, avoid cognitive decline and protect your body and your brain, you wanna be a plant eater, more plants, less animal food. All right, so let's move on to the next topic, which is hypothyroidism. And um, I got this question via email and thought I would take some time to answer it. Has the incidence of hypothyroidism increased, or is it that we're diagnosing more cases of it because we've changed the diagnostic criteria? It's probably a combination of both. And this is an important issue because diagnostic criteria uh, are often set by groups that, have, um, that are supported by drug companies. And of course, the more people meet the new criteria, um, the more people take drugs and it's good for business, not necessarily good for people. The American Thyroid Association, which is sponsored in part by the drug companies, recommends medicating at a certain level of thyroid stimulating hormone, and those levels have changed over the last several years. Um, so what they, look, what they recommend the doctor do is look at TSH levels if the person tests positive for thyroid autoantibodies or has evidence of cardiovascular disease, but there is some evidence that perhaps we have changed the diagnostic criteria and that is what is responsible for the epidemic of hypothyroidism. Now, why this is an important issue is that there are risks with overtreatment, including the risk of further suppressing thyroid function. And I'm gonna come back to that later because it's a very important issue. But in one study, uh, a UK research group um, had a cohort of, of 52,298 adults, pretty big group, who were placed on medication between hypothyroidism between 2001 and 2009. It was a retrospective cohort study. They excluded people who had previously had hyperthyroidism because sometimes medicating for that can cause hypothyroid, pituitary disease, thyroid surgery, patients taking medications that affected their thyroid, and women who had thyroid problems related to pregnancy. It was mostly women hypothyroidism occurs in women significantly more than it does with men. And uh, the researchers reported that there was a 30% increase in the number of patients with TSH levels abnormal outside of the reference range who were placed on medication. And the number of new prescriptions for levothyroxine increased 74% during the study period. And they expressed concern that perhaps our diagnostic criteria has been changed so much that we're treating a lot of people who we shouldn't be treating. And of course, the issue with thyroid testing and any other condition that we're testing for is that um, is what is considered normal. And the fact that biomarkers fluctuate, and it's always important to remember that a blood test, for example, only freezes a moment in time. And studies have shown that small abnormalities outside of reference ranges often just resolve themselves in a few months without any treatment at all. And that aging can change numbers too, including TSH levels, but it doesn't necessarily mean that something is wrong. Um, another issue is there is no research that has clearly established benefits resulting from treating somebody with mildly elevated TSH levels. Um, so we don't really benefit from medicating these patients. We might um, actually be suppressing thyroid function. And um, as a result, we're making people dependent on thyroid medication who might actually have self-corrected if we just left them alone. And I'll um, refer to a book that I've recommended frequently 
recently on these video clips written by Gilbert Welch called Overdiagnosed, where he has expressed an enormous amount of concern in the articles that he writes and in that book that we're testing people all the time. You find these small abnormalities. Are you better off not knowing about them? You're certainly better off not being treated for them. So my advice for people who uh, test abnormal on TSH levels, their blood tests for the first time, is to wait a few months and then get tested again to make sure that the problem is real and persistent before you agree to treatment. And during that time of active surveillance, I don't like the term watchful waiting because I think it just implies we're doing nothing at all. Active surveillance implies we're gonna do something about it. We're gonna try to make things better. Improved diet and lifestyle habits, since there is considerable evidence that hypothyroidism is related to diet and lifestyle. And then drugs may be necessary. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that we should never medicate um, people with hypothyroidism. There are people who absolutely need the medication. The key is making sure that if you're taking it, you're one of those people who really needs it. So, um, you know, before we get into a lifetime of medication, which is what it turns into, let's see if the problem can be resolved. And keep it on a short string. I mean, you don't do active surveillance for two years with hypothyroidism, but you can certainly wait for three to six months and test again. So this is a very long answer to the original question that my person posed in the email. Um, is there an epidemic of hypothyroidism or is it the change diagnostic criteria? It's a little bit of both, but uh, be careful that every time you test abnormal in some area or outside the reference range, because remember it's a reference range, it's not uh, a hard and fast rule that this is the only normal parameter uh, for a particular marker. Um, but just, you know, don't be so quick to jump into being treated for everything every time there's an abnormality. So I'll end with that. And uh, uh, please, as usual, pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it. And I will be back to you again on Thursday. Have a great day.